Hey, greetings everyone. It's GleeCon, and I'm back again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. On our last episode, we continued the Let's Play portion of the show, um, this time picking up where we left off with Talanji, our rogue. Um, and it was a lore episode. A lore of my life. <laughs> So as sometimes happens when there's a lot of travel, but we did pick up, you know, a little bit of the uh, lore of the region. We we moved over to the Zorm Strand and we saw kind of the initial hordes battles against some of the Hydras and Naga of the region. And uh, we started collecting some of the things that we need to get the supplies to that area, which is kind of what's going on in Ashenvale. You're, you're, you're fighting the existing forces there. You're fighting the Night Elves. You are supplying up for one of the real battle battlegrounds of World of Warcraft. Um, we've also been reading through the World of Warcraft magazine in our every other episode kind of aspect. Um, this is a rare run and we are getting uh, pretty far into the second issue. It's a short lived series and I am I'm curious. I finally finished scanning and uploading them all. So now at least the, the legwork is done on my side. But uh, and again, at some point, I'll probably make these available in PDF form. Um, either just for everyone for fun, or maybe I'll do it as an exclusive, like subscriber type of thing. Uh, so yeah, stay a while and listen, last time we talked about like the strategy to attack the different faction leaders and some other stuff, but this time we're going to do a deep dive into, uh, ice crown Citadel. Last night I mentioned that, um, wasn't sure if I was going to get a chance to, to make an episode today. And I thought the chances were slim, but then look at this. It ended up working out. Uh, I actually ended up being able to leave, not have to stay and pull a crazy long day. Um, so I got home with time to try and come squeeze one in. And even if we just read this one article, cause it's a long one, at least we'll get a pretty big chunk of the way through this issue. All right, dismantling Ice Crown Citadel. It's time for Azeroth's heroes to face the Lich King. We talk with some of the world's top guilds to get tips to help you battle your way through Ice Crown Citadel all the way to the Frozen Throne. And, um, you know, I was, I never got this far because at this point in the expansion, right when this was getting going is, is at a time when um, I, originally I, I kind of tapered off in the game because my account got hacked. And um, it was not until a few expansions later that I really got back into it with an end level character. So I was never had an opportunity to uh, to do this. I mean, I've played through Ice Considered a lot, just not in that level experience. Like I've ran it with a guild party for, to get invincible drops or I've soloed it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be able to inform people that are playing Wrath Classic now yet, but we'll eventually get there too. In Northrend lies the Frozen Throne. Once a prison crafted by Kil'jaeden to contain the Lich King, the twisted spirit of the evil orc shaman Nerjul, the block of icy crystal now, sits shattered at the heart of Ice Crown Citadel. It serves as a cold reminder of the moment Arthas Menethil, Crown Prince of Lordaeron and Knight of the Silver Hand, merged with the Lich King to become the new Overlord of the Scourge, with Lich King Nerjul. In Ice Crown Citadel, champions of the Horde and the Alliance gather in groups of 10 or 25 to face the vilest members of the Lich King's army. To help you get the most out of your adventures through the Scourge's Sanctum, we spoke with some of the top Horde and Alliance guilds on North American and European realms, comparing and contrasting the different tactics used by these players may help you determine the best strategies for you. We've also included a few tips from the World of Warcraft official magazine staff to help those who are running a, who are running a pickup group or tackling these dungeons for the first time. So here's the expert guilds. Uh, cuties only. <laughs> this is a horde guild on Kill Jaden. Cytokinesis uh, is a guild member named Aaron Shamber. He's an orc shaman. Ekun Ek Lol is maybe that's like lol nuke backward is kevin uyang a guild master and orc warlock vodka is an alliance guild set in the ultra mountain us server melthu is played by bryce aona who is a guild officer night elf druid balance is an alliance guild in grim batal european meli is played by matthias mothander and is a guild officer draenei hunter hot is played by mark bub he's a guild master and human paladin Envy is a horde guild on Oshendun, European. Dappercad is played by Jake and ha Jacob Harmon. He's a guild website content manager and a Blood Elf Paladin. Stinach, played by Stina, 
Fredrickson is a guild officer orc warlock, and Teferi, played by Matic Gerbic, is a guild officer undead mage. All right, so we have five player dungeons. Um, I'm thinking these are the ones that sort of lead up to it. Here we have a couple of the bosses, Scourge Lord Tyrannus and Ick and Crick, uh, a little gnomish kind of, I don't know if he's a death knight or just a weird necromancer and he's got his thing he's riding. I don't even know which one is Ick and which one is Crick, I don't remember. So there are the Frozen Halls. The final journey to the Lich King begins in the Frozen Halls, a wing of Ice Crown Citadel that houses three five-player dungeons, Forge of Souls, Pit of Saron, and Halls of Reflection. Players must successfully navigate the dungeons in that order. The Forge of Souls unlocks Pit of Saron, which opens Hall of, of Reflection. Alliance parties are accompanied by Lady Jane of Proudmoor, and Horde players are led by Lady Sylvanas Windrunner. The Forge of Souls. The first boss that players encounter in this dungeon is Bronyam, Godfather of Souls. Make sure your party kills the corrupted soul fragments and stays out of Soul Storm, and Bronyam will definitely not feel good. The last boss in the forge is the Devourer of Souls. The Devourer casts Phantom Blasts, inflicting shadow damage upon the tank. He also casts a Well of Souls, hitting any member of the party unfortunate enough to be standing in the area with some serious shadow damage. Party members should also be on the lookout for Mirrored Soul, as any damage done to the Devourer while this ability is active will be mirrored on the target of the spell, forcing the party to pull back on damage or risk losing a member. As a shaman, this fight is really fun, says Cytokinesis. You have two options, kill him really fast, which is what we almost always do, or play conservatively, making sure to interrupt fat Phantom Blast and not kill your friends. As a Shaman, I can stop so many Phantom Blasts that the tank basically takes no damage. You gotta watch out for the Wailing Souls ability, which is sort of a Cthune-esque beam that will melt your face if you get caught in it, warns Melly. And Pit of Saron. Defeating the Devourer of Souls opens a portal to Pit of Saron. Here players face two bosses and a gauntlet of ice before confronting the dangerous Scourge Lord Tyrannus. I wonder if actually the Scourge Lord is riding. Yeah, I think it's riding that uh, Drake there, or whatever it is. Dodge Forge Master Garfrost's Serenite Boulders, and then duck behind them long enough to allow the Permafrost debuff to expire. It and Crick require the party to do a lot of running away, either due to AoE damage or pursuit, but focus damage on Ick. Crick will give up when his minion dies. The tunnel on the way to Tyrannus is filled with falling ice. Stay out of the fall zones on your way to the disc in the middle of the tunnel where you should stop to kill the mobs you attract and then make your way to the top. Here's a couple of the other guys. Forge Master Garfrost we talked about. This is the five player stuff and that's the Devourer of Souls. Uh, interesting little, it's almost like a uh, Valkyr, no, not Valkyr, um, Vrykul face there. The final boss in this wing is a human death knight Tyrannus mounted upon Rhymefang, his frostworm. At the beginning of the fight, Tyrannus will dismount, attacking your party while Rhymefang circles ominously, targeting party members and blasting them with hoarfrost and icy blast. You can have the tank kite Tyrannus over frost patches during his enrage, suggests Cytokinesis. Make sure your damage classes stop doling out the damage when they're hit with the transfer damage debuff, Overlord's Brand. Have the tank use a cooldown when the healer is targeted to avoid healing Tyrannus. Once Tyrannus is down, it's on to Halts of Reflection. Players battle two lieutenants of the Lich King, Marwyn and Falric, in separate encounters before arriving at the Shadow Throne to find Lady Jane at Proudmoor for the Alliance or Lady Sylvanas Windrunner and the Horde in battle with the Lich King. She calls for the party to follow her in her escape. Players must fight off waves of the Lich King's minions while she breaks through ice walls in an attempt to get away for now. Yeah, that's a memorable fight. Have the tank in the lead... To attract the initial ghouls, advises Cytokinesis. If you can, have casters help with interrupts, getting them to move in closer to the tank for easier pickup. Kill everything and move on to the next wall. Be careful not to get too close to Arthas. On the last wall, it's advised to use all cooldown abilities because there are a hefty amount of mobs. Stinach notes, this isn't a boss fight in the classical sense. Lady Sylvanas or Jaina Proudmoor will be with you while the Lich King hunts you, so you have to run for your life. Ice Crown Citadel comprises four floors and a total of 12 encounters culminating in the final battle against the Lich King. The instance hosts 10 and 25 player parties. Players are eligible to attempt the heroic mode once they have defeated the Lich King on normal mode. The guilds we contacted offered advice for both, except where noted, suggestions here can apply to any version of the instance. Uh, there's uh, Lord Marogar, because I think now we're entering yeah, the lower spire, so we're entering the actual instance. 
Sound and Fury. If you are having difficulty picking up on a visual cue on transitions, listen to the boss. He helpfully shouts Bone Storm when he casts the spell. Uh, the, and that's his biggest threat. Bone Storm is a spell causing AoE damage and Saber Lash, which splits 200% of normal melee damage to an enemy and its two nearest allies. Marogar is made of the bones of defeated adventurers. This undead bone wraith hurls bone spikes from his body, forcing players to stay on their toes if they would like to keep them. During phase one of the Marogar encounter, we chuck everyone into melee with the boss, except for hunters, to get the bone spikes gathered up, explains Melly. It's important that all damage classes switch to these spikes and destroy them quickly. Marogar also casts Cold Flame, an AoE frost damage spell that travels in a straight line away from the boss throughout the fight, and players should steer clear. Marogar will then cast Bone Storm, whirlwinding about the room in a second phase, alternating between phase one and two. The closer you are to Marogar, the more damage you'll take from the whirlwind, Melly warns. We spread out, usually to the left and to the right of the room, deciding who goes where before we pull the boss so we have healers on both sides. Hawk shares a few notes for healers. The risk comes on heroic when players are targeted by Bone Spike Graveyard and Bone Storm at the same time. Use Hand of Protection or a lot of spam healing. Spread out so when Marogar enters the second phase, there are enough healers positioned to heal the moving damage dealers. It's like a dude right down there, like a little adventure. Getting ready to be to die and become one of the bones. Teferi offers that ranged classes should try to stay near melee, allowing them to target bone spikes and avoid cold flame. In heroic, people's mistakes are punished a lot more. It's more healing than damage intensive, so if you're having problems, bring a few extra healers. All right, so the next one is Lady Death Whisper. She looks like a sort of um, lich type character. Lady Death Whisper is a minion maker. She'll summon help as long as her mana shield's up. Once her mana shield is gone, she'll take matters into her own plan and yell, all part of the blaster's plan. Your end is inevitable. Her biggest threat is that she is protected by a massive mana shield and she attacks the party with Shadow Bolt to Death and Decay, Dominate Mind in the 25 player mode only, and waves of adds. She gains new abilities in Phase 2, volleying Frostbolts and inflicting Touch of Insignificance on tanks, uh, reducing their generated threat. Melly offers Balance's strategy, saying, In the 25-player encounter, there are seven adds spawning each wave. We like to drag them all into the middle and AoE them down, but Death Whisper's Dominate Mind makes things trickier than just splitting the adds into two sides. We put most melee DPS on Death Whisper while ranged classes utilize AoE spells. Hunters plant freezing traps to stop mind control people. We primarily utilize the Druid Cyclone. In Heroic, make sure you have a clean transition between phases, says Ekunlol. One tank needs to pick up Death Whisper and position her in the middle of the room, interrupt her frost bolts. They hit extremely hard. Hot shares some more healer tips for Death Whisper. Phase 2 is the biggest challenge. You must heal the main tank, the second tank, and melee on adds and the entire range raid when they hit when hit by frost bolts the fight was quite difficult on heroic the ghosts hit hard and have quite a range players must be aware of the differences of normal and heroic as pointed out by melthu on heroic death whisper is not tauntable so he's a single tank who gets help from tricks of the trade and misdirection dapper believes lady death whisper may be one of the toughest fights the vengeful spirits in heroic mode can cause a wipe easily Plus phase two lasts a very long time. This is where the real control comes in. You need your raid to stay focused and play well. All right, then you get on the, the ship here, the airship, and uh, that you have the gunship battle. You dare board my ship, your death will come swiftly. The biggest threat, this is completely different from any other battle in World of Warcraft. Ice Crown Citadel's third encounter has players taking part in a ship battle, filling both offensive and defensive roles. The objective is to deal damage to the enemy ship, saving your own in the process. Defense must keep their ship free of attackers and shoot the enemy vessel, while offense lays siege on board the enemy ship. Before the aerial battle between Horde and Alliance gunships begins, Melthu advises the main tank and all melee to grab a rocket pack from the Goblin. When in combat, you want players on defense handling the cannons and periodically attacking the enemy ship. Periodically, a group of mobs will take a portal to board your ship, Melthu notes. Have your off-tank pick them up and let ranged damage classes kill them. The enemy will be firing rockets at your ship constantly. Their target will show up as a bright circle on your ship. Move out of this area to avoid being hit. Eventually, a Skybreaker Sorcerer or Corcoran Battle Mage will come out of the enemy ship and freeze your cannons. At this time, you want your main tank and melee to, to rocket jump over to the enemy ship. 
Melee should focus on the mage while the tank grabs the commander. Varrock Sourfang for the alliance or Morden Bronzebeard for the horde, bringing him near the edge and close to your ship so healers can reach the tank. The ship's commander will gain a stacking damage buff as he attacks your tank. Once the mage is dead, your cannon operators can get back inside and start hitting the enemy ship again, says Melthu. Your tank and melee should rocket jump back to your ship so you can reset the commander's damage buff. After some time, another mage will spawn, so repeat this until the enemy ship is defeated. Okay, continuing the lower spire, Deathbringer Sourfang. Oh, the ground runs red with your blood. Interesting. So I wonder if that's the Sourfang we're just talking about. Does he become a Death Knight? That's Varrock. So our main protection warrior is that, does he become a Death Knight eventually? I wonder. Um, beastly encounter. Don't let Sourfang's blood beasts hit anyone. Each blow gets Sourfang closer to casting a mark, which you don't want. Kite and stun the beasties. His biggest threat is that blood power. It's the name of the game in this encounter. Sourfang earns this through several attacks, including Rune of Blood, Blood Nova, and Blood Boil. Blood power strengthens Sourfang, enabling him to cast Mark of the Fallen Champion on a random party member whenever his blood power reaches 100%. Sourfang heals for a significant amount if the target of a mark dies. This is a two-tank fight, says Melthu. Sourfang will apply a debuff called Rune of Blood on the current tank every couple seconds. If he melees the tank while this buff is up, he will heal and gain blood power, so it's important that the off-tank taunts him immediately after he applies the debuff to the main tank. Melthor notes that throughout the fight, he will use Blood Nova and Blood Boil, a targeted and damage over time spell, respectively giving him blood power. Paladins can use Hand of Protection to remove Blood Boil, preventing him from gaining blood power. Blood Nova links affected players, giving Sourfang more power. Everyone standing at range needs a fixed position with enough space around them to avoid linking Blood Nova, Melly shares. With proper positioning, chances are no one will have to move even a yard during the entire encounter. Sourfang will spawn two Blood Beasts at regular intervals in a 10-player raid. Melly suggests one or two range players must take them down because they cannot be killed by AoE spells. Arcane Mages kick butt at killing those beasts and can usually solo them with good gear. The last and trickiest part to this fight is Mark of the Fallen Champion, warns Melthu. Whenever Sourfang reaches 100 blood power, he will send out a Mark to a random raid member. When he hits the tank with a melee attack, anyone with the Mark will take damage as well. If a marked player dies, Sourfang heals, says Dapper Cad. On normal, you might be alright, but on heroic, the fight is over. You lost. Yeah, that makes sense. You, I remember fighting Fester Guy. Now we've moved on to the next section of the Citadel called the Plague Works. Uh, gas pains. Players become inoculated by standing near gas spores when they blow up. It's gross, that big fat eyeball that slipped down into his chest. Old Fester Gut. The biggest threat for Fester Gut is his gaseous blight, which inflicts constant shadow damage on all players. Its raid damage lessens when inhale blight is cast, but it makes Fester Gut stronger and faster, increasing the damage tanks will be taking. Gastric Bloat strengthens tanks, but explodes and instantly kills a player with 10 stacks. Players must intentionally be hit by gas spores in order to become inoculated, resisting 25 damage per stack, which is important when Pungent Blight hits. Faster Gut applies a stacking debuff called Gastric Bloat to the current tank that increases the tank's damage, but will blow up the rate if the stack reaches 10. You need two tanks in order to taunt Faster Gut back and forth. Every so often, a handful of people will get a debuff called Gas Spore, says Melthu. After 10 seconds, the spores will blow up, and damage anyone nearby. But the gas spores aren't all bad. You will then be inoculated and resistant to shadow damage by 25% per stack. This is necessary later in the fight, so you actually want everyone to get hit by a gas spore whenever they go out. Melly says each party member must have three stacks of inoculation. When Fester Gut casts Pungent Blight on normal mode, you can survive with only two stacks of inoculated, but on heroic, you can't do that. If we have someone with only two stacks, we need to use something like Guardian Spirit or Pain Suppression. All guilds strongly suggested raiders keep their distance spread out, except for when you need to get hit by a spore, because Fester Gut will use Vile Gas, which disorients a target and everyone near that target, says Melthu. And Rot Face, very similar. Um, actually, look here. Yeah, look, he's got like eyeballs on him and this big mouth. It actually looks like almost part of the same thing. Maybe it's this little guy. The ooze will explode, sending missiles flying. The raid needs to avoid getting hit. The biggest threat is that parties must contend with rot face and plenty of oozes that spawn as mutated infections are removed. Little oozes add up to big oozes, which could spell big trouble. 
Good news, everyone. There's also ooze floods and sticky ooze. Dinatch starts by sharing simply, I love this fight. Maximizing damage while moving is key. You'll start the fight focusing damage on Rot Face. On Heroic, it's a good idea to spread out, since Professor Putricide will throw vile gas from the balcony hitting random places in the room. This fight only requires one tank, says Melthu. You also need a Kiter, which can be your second tank, or it can be a Hunter, or a Death Knight. Every couple of seconds, Rot Face will turn towards someone in the raid and spew a slime spray. The raid simply needs to move out of this cone to avoid taking damage. Every few seconds, Rotface will cast Mutated Infection on a raid member, which does damage and lowers healing received, explains Melthu. When this disease runs its course or is dispelled, a little ooze will spawn and attack the player. If two little oozes are near each other, they'll form a big ooze. The big ooze does AoE damage and melee damage, so they should be kited. If a big ooze is brought near a small ooze or another big ooze, they will merge and form a bigger big ooze, which is indicated by stacks of unstable ooze. Once the stack reaches five, the big ooze will explode, sending missiles of sl slime flying toward players. The raid needs to move to avoid getting hit. And we have Professor Putricide. Uh, table manners. Putricide's table has potions that give him more abilities, but it's not all bad. The table is also where one of your parties turns into the abomination. Party members. One of your party. Uh, this mad scientist will throw everything but the kitchen sink, mutated slime, choking gas bombs, and malleable goo at your party. Ooze gas and an abomination run rampant in the room. Melvin reports that Vodka utilizes three tanks for this fight. In Putricide's first two phases, you need one main tank, an off-tank driving the Abomination, and the third will simply do damage. Throughout the fight, Putricide will create two slime puddles that grow over time and do AoE damage. The off-tank controlling the Abomination needs to eat these puddles to gain ooze energy and destroy them so they don't cover the room. There are two different types of ooze. Putricide will create unstable experiments that summon either a green volatile ooze or an orange gas cloud, says Melthu. The volatile ooze roots a party member and then explodes for a lot of damage, and gas clouds will target and chase a random member. Again, players must be on the lookout for the gaseous bloat debuff that starts at 10 stacks and ticks down over time. Melthu explains if the gas cloud reaches the player, it will expose, explode and do damage to the raid based on how many stacks were remaining on the player. If the gas cloud reaches the target, or if all of the target stacks of gaseous bloat wear off, it will stop and target a new player to chase. To handle gas clouds, you simply have the targeted player kited around the room while the rest of the raid kills it. Melly describes phase transitions at 80% health and 35%. Putricide will tear gas the raid, stunning everyone for 20 seconds while he plays with his alchemy lab. Rogues and mages can avoid the stun by using vanish or invisibility during the tear gas cast. This trick will allow them to lay damage to the boss for an extra 20 seconds. Mm, that's cool. In phase three, there are no longer is an abomination to drive, so slime puddles will grow unchecked, explains Melthu. Putricide will also start placing a stacking debuff on his target every couple of seconds called Mutated Plague. If this debuff wears off or is removed by a tank's death, Putricide will heal for a large amount. Uh, oh, this is this boss is complicated enough. He needs two pages. In addition, this debuff does damage to the raid based on its stack size. A single stack does little damage, but it grows exponentially. Good news, everyone. I think I've perfected a plague that will destroy all life on Azeroth. As a result, setting up a taunt rotation for tanks will keep the stacks as low as possible. Melthu explains a single tank with four stacks of the debuff will be the, do the same amount of raid damage as three tanks with three stacks each. Our usual rotation is 1 2 2 3 3 3 4 4 4. The first tank gets one stack, then the second tank taunts and takes two stacks, then the third tank taunts and takes two stacks, and the first tank taunts again and keeps it for three stacks, and so on. This ends up being a soft enrage as four stacks of the debuff will test your healers, and a single five stack will wipe your raid in short order. Sinach says that the Unbound Plague and Heroic is a big pain. Everyone needs to know if they have it. Let it tick for about five seconds and then get rid of it and try not to get it again. Shadow Priest can use Dispersion to keep the Plague for longer, which is helpful, and other classes can use other cooldowns to keep it for longer. The longer a player keeps the Plague without dying, the better. Akun Law shared a tip that his guild uses in positioning. Tank Putricide beside a slime pool so the Abomination can do sick damage while taking care of the pool. The Abomination does a lot of damage, so take advantage of it. All right, then we have the we moved on to the Crimson Hall, beginning with the Blood Prince Council, made of Keliseth, Valinar, and Taldoram. The biggest threat of this trio is that the princes share a health pool and only one may be damaged at a time. Parties must focus on their active prince with Invocation of Blood. Each has a different set of abilities to test the raid. 
Echo Lol explains. The first Prince Valinor has empowered Shock Vortex, so always spread out on pull. We originally had a Hunter tank Keleseth, but recently swapped to a Death Knight with a weird spec for grabbing orbs and range tanking. We assigned three people to deal with Valinor's kinetic bomb, says Melly. Pet classes are great here because you can just send your pet on it to keep it from hitting the ground and exploding. We use our two hunters and a death knight for that job. They take one bomb each, and by the time the fourth bomb spawns, the first one will have expired. When the prince is swapped, the raid must change their focus, Millie says. When Prince Taldrum is empowered and casts empowered flame, we have our melee team follow and soak up the flame ball to make it shrink in size and damage. Otherwise, we risk the flame ball being too large and melting the face of the unlucky guy at targets. Teferi addresses the next prince. When Keleseth is empowered, he will cast empowered shadow lance bolts at a range. I find the best classes for this job are Shadow Priest with Dispersion or Mage with Blink and Ice Block. In terms of healing on this encounter, even on Heroic, the only big damage takers are the three tanks, says Hot. We use a Death Knight to tank Prince Keleseth as the spell damage reduction talents and anti-magic shell make it a lot easier for this class. Melly offers some additional notes for Heroic. The kinetic bombs drop faster and only having three people taking care of them will most likely not be enough. The spawn and despawn rates remain the same, but the pets might not make it there in time. We use six players to take care of the kinetic bombs in Heroic mode with three teams of two. A Heroic debuff may keep your party stationary, says Melly. Shadow Prison is applied to anyone when moving. The raid members simply need to limit their movement and let the debuff reset by standing still. Okay, moving along, you have Blood Queen Lanathel. She looks like a, almost like a succubus night elf, or I mean blood elf. You have made an unwise decision, know my hunger. Or a female, um, what are those, dreadnoughts, or not dreadnoughts, what are they called? Um, dang, the things that work for uh, Sylvanas um, that are all in Shadowlands. It's all about location. Blood Bolt, Pact of the Dark Fallen, and Swarming Shadows require players to be aware of where their allies are, so keeping tabs on your location is especially important. Her biggest threat is that blood, the Blood Queen is not a vampire you want to mess with. She bites party members, empowering them with Essence of the Blood Queen for a minute before they must bite another raid member to avoid going into a frenzied bloodlust. Her Blood Mirror ability reflects damage done to the main tank to the closest party member. Melthu prescribes two tanks for this fight, one to handle Lanathel and one to stand near the main tank and be the Blood Mirror. This tank will take exactly the same damage as the main tank in the form of shadow damage and is determined by proximity to the main tank. After the fight begins, Lanathel will bite a player, giving them Essence of the Blood Queen. This increases the damage and healing by 100%, causing the player to heal as they do damage while preventing them from generating threat, explains Melthu. But after one minute, they will get frenzied bloodlust and must bite another player who doesn't already have Essence of the Blood Queen or they'll become mind-controlled. Melthu continues, she'll also give three players Pact to the Dark Fallen, which does damage to everyone nearby. To remove this debuff, affected players must all run to each other. You can see who has the debuff by visible red beams linking the players. We have players with Pact run to the center of the room. Melly and the members of Balance have developed a web-based tool to easily create bite rotations. We assign who bites who with the vampire debuff and when. The Blood Queen also has an air phase, says Akun Lol. I feel special at this part because I'm a shaman. Lanathel flies into the air in the center of the room and fears the entire raid casting Blood Bolt. If you have timers, drop Tremor Totem for your group so they only take a quick millisecond of fear so they don't have to repossession. Remember to stay spread out. If you splash her Blood Bolt whirl, someone will die. Sometimes the timer for the air phase and vampire bite occur at the same time, so you have to use a cooldown spell on the biter or the bitten. Healer Hawk warns that the Blood Queen fight includes high raid damage. Damage is actually highest on the raid at the start, as it is dramatically reduced as more and more players are bitten. During the air phase, we use Mass Dispel to remove the fear while we get into position. Then Paladins will use either Shadow Aura or Aura Mastery to reduce the raid damage, or Divine Shield and Divine Sacrifice for 20% less raid damage. Okay, now we've moved into the Frostwing Halls, beginning with Velithria Dreamwalker. I believe this is the one that makes this raid unbeatable without a healer. I cannot hold them off much longer. You must heal my wounds. The biggest threat is that your raid wants to heal Dreamwalker and save her from an onslaught of Scourge. Healers should utilize Emerald Vigor, a buff that regenerates additional mana and increases healing and damage done. Dreamwalker is a completely different encounter from what we're used to in World of Warcraft, explains Hot. The burden is on the healers to lead the fight. To rescue Velithria, the healers need to heal her fully, while the rest of the raid keep away the adds that spawn at her sides. 
The encounter provides portals to Valithria's Emerald Dream, where players collect a healing buff, Emerald Vigor, by flying around an empty copy of the raid room. This buff stacks, providing 10% more damage and healing per stack, but only lasts for 30 seconds. Healers have to be careful and make sure they re-enter the dream state before their timers run out. After getting 25 to 30 stacks on 4 to 5 healers in 25 player mode, it becomes easier to finish the healing. Okay. Dapper Cad shared some logistics behind collecting the Emerald Vigor buff. Because the glowing balls explode, giving Emerald Vigor to anyone in a small range, Emmy uses four healers in portals during 25 player raids. Two lead healers who pop glowing balls, and two following healers who do their best to be in range when they pop, says Dapper Cad. Toward the end of the fight, when you're near soft in rage and your portal healers have 30 or more stacks of the buff, drop Bloodluster Heroism on them as they leave the portals for the last time to increase their healing output. Healers should also save healing output cooldowns for this moment. To handle the spawns during the healing, Melthu splits the raid into two halves, each with a tank and some melee. Range stays near the middle, helping whichever side has more mobs at the time. We always prioritize killing the Blazing Skeletons first, then the Suppressors, Blistering Zombies, Risen Archmages, and finally the Gluttonous Abominations, shares Millie. Okay, um, yeah, we're still in Frostwind Halls. As we continue that, we have Sindragosa. This is one of the most epic, iconic for Wrath. Normal dragon rules apply when engaging Sindragosa. Everyone except the tank should avoid her head and tail. The biggest threat is that Sindragosa tail smashes and cleaves, so melee should be located on her sides. Her frost aura deals heavy damage, affecting the entire raid during ground phases. Blistering cold will likely kill non-tanks. Melthu explains the first of many phases of the undead frostworm. In phase one, tank her where she lands. She has a frontal cone frost breath, a cleave, and a tail smash, so melee need to stand at her side. Range damage dealers and healers can stack up a few yards behind melee. Whenever you attack Sindragosa with a melee or ranged weapon, you have a chance to get a stack of Chilled to the Bone, which is a damage over time spell that increases as you get more stacks, explains Melthu. To remove this debuff, you need to stop attacking for a couple seconds. You can afford to get a couple stacks, but you don't want to go higher than five or six if you don't have to. Melthu warns throughout the fight she will afflict multiple casters and healers with unchained magic, causing them to gain a stack of instability every time they cast a spell. After instability wears off, it will do damage to the caster based on how many stacks they had. This is important for healers to communicate with each other and change their healing targets if needed. Sindragosa will eventually grip all of the players to herself and then start casting Blistering Cold, which will probably kill any non-tank non that gets hit by it, says Melthu. Players need to run away from her after getting gripped and stay out until she's finished casting. Melee shares an important tip. Once Sindragosa pulls everyone into melee with her icy grip ability, we have a hunter use aspect of the pack to speed up the raid running away from Blistering Cold. It isn't needed, but it helps. You won't get dazed by damage besides the tank from melee attacks. After 50 seconds of pass, Sindragosa will fly into the air for her next phase and target several raid members with Frost Beacon, casting Ice Tomb and freezing them inside blocks of ice. Raid members must stay away to avoid being frozen. Sindragosa will then send out Frost Bombs and the raid needs to move behind an Ice Tomb. After four frost bombs, she will land again. At this point, you should finish killing off the ice tombs, as players inside will gain asphyxiation and quickly die, warns Melthu. When Cindergosa hits 35%, you enter the new and last phase, says Stinach. She won't fly anymore, but she'll cast Frost Beacon on random targets. Cindergosa will also start casting Mystic Buffet, which will stack up on the whole raid. You'll have to rest the re reset the debuff by running behind the ice tomb. The beacon will be cast regularly, so I will damage Sindragosa when the beacon pops up. I'll swap my focus to the first guy who got entombed and free him. You can't hit the tomb too fast since people will have to have time have to get time to reset the buff. Malthus says a second tank is needed for this phase, as Frost Breath will become too deadly to live through once Mystic Buffet stacks too high on the tank. The two tanks need to rotate between resetting their stacks of Mystic Debuff of Mystic Buffet and taunting Sindragosa to allow the other tank to reset its stacks. Ekinlul reminds players that, all in all, it's a slow burn and more of a control fight, so don't let it get the best of you. All right, we're on to the final. Yeah, and this has already taken more than half an hour just to get through these raid bosses, and this is probably the longest one. This is at the frozen throne itself, the Lich King fight. Setup time. The Lich King doesn't aggro until the raid talks to Fordring, so you can take the time to arrange your group as you like. Go ahead. <laughs> Slash bonk Arthas while you can. Him. There. 
forging tag like tied up there the biggest threat is it's isn't an exaggeration to state that the entire fight is filled with danger it is the most complicated encounter of ice crown citadel summoned ghouls plagues and all manner of damage befall the raid in this final encounter in all the final battle of ice crown citadel can be described as a five-phase fight we use two tanks, says Melthu. In phase one, your main tank will take the Lich King and the off tank will handle adds. The Lich King will summon two types of adds in this phase, drudge ghouls and shambling horrors. Ghouls are weak, but horrors need to be tanked and faced away from the raid as they have a frontal cone attack. Melthu continues, in this phase, the Lich King will give a random player a complicated disease called necrotic plague, ticking for 100,000 damage every five seconds per stack in 25 player mode. When dispelled, or the target dies, the plague will jump to another nearby target and give the Lich King a stacking damage buff. To handle this disease, you have to have the afflicted player run to the off tank get and get the dispelled plague to jump to one of the mobs. It will quickly kill any ghouls it lands on and increase in size. Once it hits a shambling horror, it will do large amounts of damage, and if allowed to bounce between the horrors and the ghouls, it will take care of the adds by itself. Also, throughout the fight, the Lich King will cast Infest, which does damage to the entire raid, and places a debuff on players that does constant damage until they're healed to 90% or more of their total health. Ekenlold describes the transition phase. When Arthas hits 70%, he'll perform Remorseless Winter. When Arthas is near that mark, you'll want to start moving as a raid to a side of the platform. You'll be, you will beg for mercy and I will deny you. Move on to it immediately to avoid damage. Have hunters shoot at the ice spheres that spawn as they progress to the platform. Chain, the unfortunate soul restrained on the frozen throne is High Lord Bolvar Four Dragon, who can be heard resisting the Lich King when players enter the Citadel. But Eklund warns the platform does not keep the raid safe. If you get hit, it will knock you into oblivion and you'll be out of the fight for good. Raging spirits will also spawn off of raid members, so they need to be tanked. Focus them down and watch for Arthas to stop casting. When he does, move back onto the platform because the ledge will fall off. Melly describes the next full phase. Once the phase starts, we make sure to finish off any remaining raging spirits and collapse in the middle of the platform. Valkyr fly in and grab people and will always fly towards the shortest route off the platform. The Valkyr will then drop players off the edge to their deaths. Staying in the middle gives us maximum time to kill them before they can reach the end. In the 25 player version of the encounter, there are three Valkyrs, so we have three damage teams each focusing on one. Hunters can use frost traps on top of the Lich King to slow the Valkyr. It is of the utmost importance that the Valkyr gets slowed and stunned to buy enough time to kill them. It's also very important that players getting targeted for Defile run out quickly, preferably toward the throne, notes Melly. The Valkyr never fly in that direction, and having Defiles in the middle of the room is troublesome. The more players getting hit by Defile, the more it will grow, and the ability can cause a complete wipe in a matter of seconds if you're sleeping in the raid. Melly offers an additional warning. During Phase 2 and 3, the Lich King will occasionally use Soul Reaper on the main tank, which deals heavy damage and increases the Lich King's physical damage by 100% after 5 seconds. It is possible to brute force this with a very good tank, preferably a Feral Druid with a high health pool, rolling some cooldowns and focus healing the tank, but normally have a second tank who can just taunt off when this happens. Hmm. Interesting that in Wrath, now Druids are some of the best tanks. Once the Lich King re I mean, they already were decent. Once the Lich King reaches 40%, another transition stage occurs. We like to use heroism in this phase to kill the Raging Spirits fast, shares Melly. We always have one Raging Spirit brought into Phase 3 because the last one spawns just as the phase starts. It's important to kill this off as fast as possible. Melthu shares tactics of the last phase. At the end of the transition phase, the Lich King will again destroy the outer edge of the platform, and start the final phase. You'll probably still have two Raging Spirits up, which should be focused by your melee classes. The Lich King will continue to use Infest, Defile, and Soul Reaper while also gaining the ability to summon Vile Spirits. These mobs fly above melee range, will sit idly for a couple seconds, and then start flying toward the raid trying to blow up on them. These need to be handled by your Raged Damage classes. Ground targeted area of effect spells like Blizzard don't work. So the focus should be on Seed of Corruption, Living Bomb, Mind Seer, and other similar abilities. Range damage classes without an effective area of effect spell should focus single target abilities on as many of the spirits as possible. The Lich King throws a variety of attacks at players, including Remorseless Winter 
and pain and suffering both seen below during a transition. Cool picture of him and cool picture of the raid marching up to the throne. Melly notes a few additional tricks for taking down the vile spirits. They are susceptible to stuns, taunts, and slowing effects. The secondary tank could taunt a few of them to soak their explosion, and hunters can use distracting shot on each one to peel them away. Another trick is for Death Knights to use their Army of the Dead ability underneath the Vile Spirits. The army will then taunt and soak most of them. The only real danger is if multiple spirits explode in the same general area. During this final phase, the Lich King begins casting a Harvest Soul, a channeled spell that drags players toward him. If a player survives this attack, he or she will be transferred into Frostmourne, which is very, which is like a very small room, explains Melly. Inside this room, Terranus Manifil, the spirit of Arthas' father, will be fighting a spirit warden. The player needs to assist Terranus, either healing him or fighting the spirit warden. Terranus will be tanking, but if he is defeated, the Lich King will enrage outside, often causing a wipe. But players don't have to necessarily fear being pulled into Frostmourne. They must, however, keep an eye on Soul Rip, a channeled ability that does a lot of damage to Terranus, according to Melly. The player inside has to either interrupt or dispel this ability. Once the Spirit Warden is defeated, Terranus will restore the player's soul and he or she can return to the main raid. In order to maintain some small level of mystery, all we'll say next is that party members should be aware that when the Lich King's health reaches 10%, the fight is over. The Lich King will no longer fight back and may finally be killed, explains Melthu. However, it's possible that the evil of the Lich King may never truly be vanquished. And that is true. All right, looks like the next time we're going to be getting some more song Gulch, which is funny because we're, we're right in there in Asheville in the actual game. All right. You know, thanks a lot, everybody, for watching, for tuning in. I, I hope it was enjoyable um, for all the fans out there, for all the subscribers. You guys rock. And uh, I hope you get a little bit of joy out of this uh, stuff that we cover. Sometimes lore, sometimes not so much. See you next time on Lore of Warcraft.